Shalom. Welcome to The Jewish View. My name is Rabbi Nachman Simon with the Chabados of Dalmar, together with my co-host Mark Ronich of Statewide News Service, jbiztechvalley.com, and now columnist for the Jewish Press. And uh, in the column I talk about how government relates to the Jewish community, or doesn't as the case may be, and uh, talk about government. So we have one of uh, the biggest environmental advocates at the Capitol, Peter Romanowitz. Uh, welcome back to The Jewish View. Great to be back again, Mark. And Thank you're you, the Rabbi. executive director mm -hmm. of Environmental Advocates of New York State. I am, yeah. We've so, been there for two years now. That's uh, it. Running the show. So and it's, you it's were at the Department of Environmental Conservation before that? Or? Yeah, well, before that, I was actually flying back and forth every week to um, Washington, D.C., where I ran a campaign for American Lung Association of how to reduce air pollution and how to prevent sort of the attacks on the Clean Air Act. Um, and then two years ago is when I started environmental advocacy. But before that, yeah, I was in government. I was running the environmental agency. I was working for Governor Patterson and Spitzer in their, their tenure. So um, I like and to joke. When people say my bio, I always say it's hard, uh, it's hard for me to keep a job. But there's a, lot, there's a lot going on in this political space, and I've been in and out of the government for 30 years now. And that's the same with me. Every six months, someone asks me for a new business card because they know that I always have something new going on. It what happens. would you say? But you don't even have a gray hair. I mean, you've been through all this, so that's good. Yeah, I look, my dad's just starting to get gray, and he's in his 70s, so wow. maybe I can last that long. Those I don't know. Jeans. It's getting thinner, and, and there's some gray up there. Now. What's your report card on the environment, though? Things are getting better, worse? It's about holding steady in some key areas, like, um, you know, legislature sort of coming up with some new funding to uh, clean up water infrastructure. Pipes underground are breaking. Sewer pipes are breaking far too frequently. You're, you yeah, and because you're, it's aging? I mean, it is. It just, Infrastructure is aging. It's really important. I mean, people don't want sewage backing up in their basements. Of course, um, yeah. I think? had to replace my <laughs> sewer line a couple summers ago, uh, just running from my house to the street in Del Mar, and it cost me $10,000. So you can imagine really? if the entire sort of town needs to get dealt with. And in Del Mar this summer, I mean, a lot of streets were ripped up. They're replacing yeah. a massive sewer yeah, line. Yeah, I was a little saw there, yeah. Well, so there was by a the huge police station and the library, yeah, I think they the were. Whole they're still working on it. Yeah, they're still working on it. Yeah, it's the project that, yeah. that started in the middle of the winter, it went through all summer, and they're still doing it now. So that's what I mean by sewage infrastructure and what's going on. And there is a huge, a, a multi-billion, tens of billions of dollar need statewide. And last year in the budget, the legislature, they pushed back against the governor. The governor included no new money for this, even though we had a lot of money last year for infrastructure. He included none of it in his budget. And the legislature said, let's put some money into this. So they created a three-year program at $200 million to help communities with grants, not loans. This is direct grants to communities who are really in need. That's important. And Need for what are they going to get? Sewer lines, you're saying? Or? Precisely. More, more funding without any strings attached, no loans. It's just straight grant money for needy communities so they can improve sewer lines. Also, drinking water systems. People get these boil water alerts or you hear a water main break. That's the water we drink. Um, and the aging infrastructure is crumbling, so we need more money to fix the pipes. You know, That's I, I, a big I, part of what happened last budget cycle. I don't mean this as a pun, but isn't $200 million a drop in the bucket? Well, the funny thing about whether we work on oil trains or water issues, this pun's all over the place. So it is a proverbial drop in the bucket. That's where we're fighting for more. We're just putting together a coalition that will include labor, local government, environmental groups, water engineers, to push the state for doing, to do even more in the next budget cycle. Do you think there needs to be Environmental Bond Act for, to do something like this? Or? Well, it certainly would help, but we have more than $2 billion sitting in bank accounts right now from settlements with financial institutions, so there's plenty of money right now. Two to, billion to, with two a B. Two billion with a B. You know, there's a lot of money in Albany right now to put into projects like this, and rather than spend it on proverbial one-shots, mm -hmm. This is the time to invest in our infrastructure to help communities fix their pipes. So that was a big part of what happened last year. We saw some bad stuff in the budget. Um, the governor pulled some funds away from one of the agencies uh, that was meant to reduce carbon pollution that is associated with climate change, and he put it into the general fund. Um, it's really sort of, they robbed Peter to pay Paul. Uh, in this scenario, and that was a, an egregious act. We really shouldn't see that going forward with the governor's climate commitment. What do you say about air quality? I mean, is that getting better? I mean, not even a year or two, but maybe let's say a 10, 20 year oh, yeah. graph. Tremendously improve, improved oh, air bad. quality. Yeah, so the pollution reductions have been coming down, even because though the economy is growing. Because we've invested in pollution control technologies, because we have really good regulatory standards set by in federal and state agencies that have ratcheted down smokestack emissions. And the cars we drive are 
worlds cleaner than mm -hmm. they were even 10, 15, 20 years ago. Right. Mark will remember this. We would battle with the car companies you know, in the mid-90s when right. Pataki was governor about whether they should be required to sell electric cars. Now they're out there marketing them. Mm -hmm. Indeed, one company has loaned my organization a car in six months. It's a plug-in electric hybrid car so that we could test it and become more familiar with it. So those laws and regulations that were set up in the early 1990s are bearing the fruit now in improved air quality. And you know are what? we there yet? <coughs> we have more work to do. And you know what's good much, with, much more improved. with the electric cars is that now that you've got places that you can actually plug in, and uh, whether it's at Colony Center or wherever, I mean, there are places around at least the Capital District where there are plug-ins, and you can go shopping and then come out and get a recharged car. Yeah, it certainly is beneficial to extend the range of them. But i got to be honest with you. We have a plug-in electric hybrid from one of the car companies, and I've been driving back and forth from my office to Albany, uh, to Del Mar, round trip without mm -hmm. having to charge it up. Uh, so you can really have an all-electric commute with a plug-in electric hybrid. You don't need a full battery one. And at night, I don't have to go find a charging station. I literally plug it into the wall socket of my garage. Yeah, but then you're fully. paying the electric bill. You know what? I looked at my bill, yeah. $3 last month. That was the increase, September to October versus October to November when I had the car. So this just started with the six months. So you're going to have it, it through did. the winter. Yep. Okay, now what about the trunk space? Oh, there's no trunk space to really you know, mention. You can maybe, if you're lucky, fit a, a set of golf clubs in this trunk. So it, there are definitely some limitations. It's, has it gotten to the stage where it can fully supplant? Uh, the typical sedan now? No, but that's why we're continuing to require sure. the car companies to make cleaner versions of gasoline-powered cars to clean up gasoline. So Yeah, yeah. Yep. Oh. I think that if you just need the commute and you don't need any space in the car, look, there are people who have just two-seat uh, sports cars. Yeah, those yeah. little cars. So, you know, they right. get by with that, so yep. now you can have sort of You're a... You're absolutely right. Uh, something that's not a sports car that st yeah. <laughs> still has two seats. Yeah. So last week I yeah. needed to go down to New York City and I uh -huh. used it in a sort of a dual mode situation, half gasoline, half electric, and I was getting 52 to 53 miles per gallon driving down the throughway because sometimes it would run on the battery, sometimes it would run on the gasoline engine. That's pretty good, you know, vehicle mileage that mm -hmm. way. Because when I got that's to New like York three City, gallons, yeah. that's three gallons of gas each way. Yeah, and basically it was, you know, when I was in Manhattan, I was running on pure battery power at that point. So in the urban environment, I wasn't belching on emissions to harm people. On the throughway, I was getting superior gas mileage. So those types of products are out there, whereas 20 years ago, we were constantly fighting with the car makers about doing this stuff. So, you so that's why we can sit here today and say air quality's gotten better. You want to give it a plug, what car? No, I don't. Okay, you get it. Plug. Okay. <laughs> See, uh, <laughs> right. yeah. we've got two already in the set. So in New more? York City, I mean, you, I mean, you're up here in Albany in the Capital District, but I mean, New York City is probably worse pollution than I'd imagine. Yeah, you're upstate. absolutely right. Yeah, more people, more vehicles. You have a lot more heavier concentration, so they have more bad air days in a typical summer than you would have up here in the Capital Region. But even there, air quality has been, been dramatically improved. So can you tell us about uh, your voter's guide? Uh, Absolutely. And tell us what the issues were and how many issues and then who the best and the worst were? Yeah, so I actually have two jobs at Environmental Advocates. I'm the head of our educational um, organization, which is known as Environmental Advocates. And then we have a sort of a political arm that uh, um, gets into educating voters. Um, and that's called EPL, short for Environmental Planning League. Lobby. Uh, lobby, thank you. Um, I remember when Environmental you Advocates. Yeah. Um, so we have, you know, EPL sort of exists to help educate um, voters about where legislators are on their various scores. Uh, so every year we put out in the fall this scorecard, um, and we rank legislators on the votes they take on some key legislative priorities for us. The, there weren't as many votes taken this year. We're down in the, in the single digits in, in the, hmm. the, um, the Senate um, and just 10 votes in the Assembly. So there weren't a huge amount of votes taken on environmental issues. That the could have bad. <laughs> well, you know, there weren't a lot of bad things happening, so yeah. that's good. But on the positive side, there was a huge amount of stuff that got left undone. Uh -huh. um, you know, and that's, that's one, one piece folks will find in our voter's guide. If so they who's, who's the best and who's the worst? Well, you know, it, it really depends on the issue and, and actually in the House. Um, Assembly Democrats um, definitely um, perform a little bit better than even their Senate, Demo Senate uh, Democrats and Republican counterparts. They, they certainly score a lot better than mm -hmm. Republicans in the House. But, you know, we've seen bad actors on both sides of the aisle um, with people getting pretty low scores. Do you have... Uh, 
favored in the among assembly Democrats, someone who's close to 100% or 80%? Or there are something? a number of legislators that get high marks. Typically, they're New York City based, but up in the Hudson Valley, um, members like Assemblywoman Cahill in the Hudson Valley, here locally, Assemblywoman Fahey does a really good Didi job. Dee Barrett? As does uh, John McDonald. Dee okay. Dee Barrett, uh, I don't know if score off the top of my head. Okay. Hudson Valley members typically score pretty, pretty <coughs> well on this one. There were a couple of votes. Uh, in the assembly this year that brought scores down. People voted for a bill that would um, expand the definition of biofuels, and we read that definition as being quite dirty. Um, you know, you think of fuel that is sort of grown, either wood or uh, plant material, you think, what's wrong with that? Mm -hmm. But, you know, um, the level of cleanliness depends on how you define it, and they were broadening the de definition you know, too far for our liking. Mm -hmm. So that brought some scores down in the Assembly. That bill did not get voted on in the Senate. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, in the Senate, there was a huge number of issues that they just didn't even bring up for a vote. And there were three in particular that, that trouble us from an environmental perspective, but it should trouble you know, the viewers as well, because these bills all had enough co-sponsors signed on that if they were brought to the floor, they would have passed but the current Senate leadership and past Senate leadership never brought these bills up for a vote. So sort of suppressing the sort of democratic principles of democracy. Are you more hopeful with John Flanagan being the majority leader? Well, I am. Senate? I, I have to be hopeful in my job, no, right? No, but, but there's, there are some people, let's say, if John DeFrancisco won, you wouldn't be so hopeful because he got your oil slick award. That's so. true, that's true. I mean, the, the first signal of, um, you know, Senator Flanagan continuing the sort of the ways of the Skelos Senate is that he did elevate Senator Flanagan to the deputy majority leader. Um, so you have a situation where Senator Flanagan, as you mentioned, gets our, an oil slick award from us, which is not a, uh, award of distinction from the environmental and public health side. Flanagan got? I'm sorry, I, no. I misspoke. DeFrancisco right. uh, got the oil slick award. Right. Um, and he got it because he had um, a 38 score on the scorecard. He also uh, debated members on the floor about whether diesel exhaust, the fumes that comes off of trucks, actually could make people sick. He said it doesn't. Um, and denied sort of the climate change was happening and using the cold winters as his justification. So there were a number of you know, things that Senator DeFrancisco championed this year that led us to give him this dubious distinction of getting an oil seat. So how does Senator Flanagan, as majority leader, how is his voting record? Is he have an idea off it's the top? It's poor. It's to poor honest. still. Yeah, it is. Okay. Um, you know, not a, he, not he worthy a, enough for an oil slick award, but getting there. That's right. I mean, he got a 44. Uh, his tenure was just new, so we couldn't really sort of define sort of where he was going to be in a number of different issues by that, unlike Senator mm -hmm. Francisco that, you know, took to the floor and debated these things during the budget and elsewhere. He co-sponsored a bill that would thwart Governor Cuomo's vision to reform mm -hmm. the energy vision. Um, so, I mean, there was a lot of different things that Senator DeFrancisco was doing wrong last year that got him the award. And Senator Flanagan, though his voting record was pretty poor, he didn't have the panoply of bad stuff that would give him a, that distinction. And I'm hopeful that, you know, they really do look at the scorecard, they really do look at their body of work and suppressing these bills or not voting on them, even though they had majority support, right. um, they'll look at that and say, we've got to be different than the skelos led Senate, and we should have a, a broader perspective, especially going into you know, an even numbered year from our perspective, that's usually when things get better because they're up for re-election. That's right. So are you, uh, so you gave Senator Scalos and Senator DeFrancisco uh, oil slick awards? That's correct. Okay. So Senator mm -hmm. Scalos was given the award because um, courtesy of, you know, the allegations that have been brought against him, I think all of us got a bigger peek behind the curtain of what happens in Albany. And the allegations against Senator Skelos in the federal trial that's ongoing now are that he was um, holding back on some bills being voted on because they would have been bad for his family's business interests, particularly his son's. Uh, um, bills that would rein in climate change, bills that would deal with uh, uh, moratoriums on fracking, uh, ran counter to the business interests, so they never came up for a vote. Um, you know, so we sort of found ourselves in a position of siding with the Senate majority on this one, and. Uh, the way that they dumped Senator Scalis because of these allegations, we decided that was worthy of an oil slick award. The allegations sort of arose to that level. And the uh, the guy who got the best, or the senator who got the best award, uh, uh, championing your causes the most, was Brad Hoyleman. That's right, so Senator Hoyleman senator from, from Manhattan. Manhattan. Um, this is his first year <coughs> as the ranking member of the Environmental Conservation Committee. Oh. A tremendous presence on environmental issues. 
um, you know, this is going to sound kind of like, really, you give them a award for this? But showed up at every committee meeting, ready to debate the issues, vote on them, and have a substantive discussion. That's kind of unheard in all in Senate because they can vote by proxy. They don't even have to go to the meetings. They just sort of send a proxy in. So not only go to the meetings, he was well prepared, ready to engage. He went to the floor, ready to debate the issues and raise environmental standards to a new level. He also convened what we believe is the very first forum. We can't call it a hearing because they're minority right. members. But the very first forum to talk about climate change in New York State Senate ever. Mm -hmm. When you think about that, wow, the first time ever we've had a discussion like this. But what he did is he brought some scientists in to sort of underlay sort of what's going on scientists. But more importantly, he brought in people who had been touched by extreme weather events, primarily Superstorm Sandy. They're on the front lines of climate change impacts. They're the people who are bearing the cost of the extreme weather events that are fueled by carbon pollution. And really what he did with that forum is put a human face on climate change impacts and, and underscore sort of the, the tragedy that's happening in communities, not only here in New York, but symbolically what's happening across the world as populations are impacted by extreme droughts, extreme mm -hmm. weather events, um, loss of potable water, et cetera. I mean, all these things are the symptoms of our changing climate. They're only going to get worse. Um, and on the floor, he debated issues um, such as we talked about earlier on diesel exhaust, on climate change, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So we really viewed him as an exemplar legislator that comes to work ready to work on the environment and is worthy of a legislator a year. So you got the three awards that you gave out were all in the Senate. You didn't give any awards to anyone in the Assembly. Yeah, that's right. I mean, we sort of looked at the Assembly and, and while they were voting on bills and voting our way, we didn't see somebody that was worthy of an honorable mention or even legislator of the year. That We have new chairs in both houses um, and we're hopeful that now that the leadership terminal is hopefully behind us, who knows, yeah, you never know right. what a federal prosecutor, but hopefully leadership terminal is behind us, they can really sort of buckle down and come to some agreements in 2016. So, now Bob Sweeney was the head of the assembly, head of the um, uh, Ed Environmental Conservation Committee. And Actually, he, reti he retired. And then um, he retired? He did, yeah. But he was the most, uh, he was chair, and now he's on your board. That's correct, yeah. Okay, so he's... Golden with you. I mean, he's like well, the he, top. he either got legislative of the year or honorable mention in all seven years of yeah, his right. tenure as an so, con chair. So he's um, just <laughs> and our board said, let's see if he's you know interested willing. in joining us to sort of sign up. What he's done is really bring to our board a huge amount of policy discussion, and we had a frank discussion with him. And he said to me, "Listen, I'm not on here as a figurehead or a letter, you know, name on the letter. I really want to work the issues." And that's a, I said, "That's what we want from you." That's great. So um, he's tremendous. Yeah. Primarily, he's been you know in retirement. He right. does a tremendous amount of social justice work, immigrant population work. Um, he volunteers um, very frequently for Habitat for Humanity, going overseas to help build houses. So right. he is not interested in sort of you know putting out the lobbying shingle and doing that at all. He's really enjoying what he's doing so after who's, a thirty plus year career. So who's now the chairman of the Assembly Environmental Conservation Committee? So Steve Engelbright, who's from out on the east end of Long Island, so talk at Long Island, so the North Shore, um, you know, just past Stony Brook area. So, so he's now the chair. So go figure when they talk about uh, liquefied natural gas and you know the head of the assembly, the chair of the assembly environmental conservation committee, is living just miles away from where this LNG facility would be uh, proposed for. You know, obviously. Well, yeah, that, that one was further in <laughs> off of Nassau, kind of on you know that area, and then it was going to be on the South Shore, where some of them are on the North Shore. Yeah, but I think the governor. Oh, just it would decided, be on the South Shore. Yeah, the, that's oh. where it would have been. Okay, because there was an old one that was proposed for Long Island Sound decades ago that the then Governor Patterson put in next to. Right, right, this right. This is a new one that would have been off the the Atlantic Coast. Oh, so they tried the other side of the island. Okay. Yeah. So. <laughs> and that's the one that uh, the governor nixed. Okay. Yeah, he did. he did. So what about, now, let me talk about microbead, the ban on microbeads. Yes. Because Albany County Legislature was uh, focused on this like I've never seen them focused on any issue before. Tell me, to, what is a microbead and why should we care and you know. <laughs> Absolutely. So it's kind of interesting. You focus on little tiny bits of plastic. It's not a nano bead. It's a micro bead. That's okay. correct. <laughs> yeah. It's really small. You can actually see it in products. So these are little plastic pellets that makers of consumer products, face scrub and even in some toothpaste, they put this um, as an abrasive to help exfoliate skin. It's plastic. So when you're washing your face with this stuff, you're literally rubbing plastic on your face. Hmm. The problem from an environmental and health perspective is 
They wash down the drain as you're mm -hmm. washing your face or brushing your teeth and spitting it out. Um, it goes through the sewer system and it's not stopped at the sewage treatment plant, so it gets pushed out into the water body where it collects in great numbers. Wildlife like fish and ducks and other waterfowl um, ingest it, so they take it into the system and it makes its way up the food chain. Um, and it's just, you know, not a good idea to be dumping plastic in our pristine water bodies. We have a lot of problems with our water. Last thing we should be doing is dumping plastics. So, and this issue actually came from um, the Attorney General. He proposed a bill. It's passed the Assembly a couple of years in a row by huge margins, 139 to 1 last spring. And this is one of the bills that dies in the Senate. It has more than enough sponsors mm -hmm. to pass. It was brought up for a vote, but it was, wasn't brought up for a vote. So after session ends, all these counties are seeing this report and saying, we should act. So local governments across New York State started in western New York and it started to make its way towards the Albany area. Then Long Island started to you know, enact these bans. And yeah. So they're prohibiting the, the sale of products, and their skincare products primarily, that contain these little plastic bits. So over yeah. time, you'll see a phase out. But what it really shows to us is that when you get outside of the contentiousness of either Congress or the contentious political environment of the Capitol, and you get out to where you know things are a bit more real at local government level, legislators from both sides of the aisle, you know, band together to either sponsor, co-sponsor, or vote in these things. As you mentioned, Albany County did a week ago pass this ban. It's now headed to the county executive, but it was unanimous. And I understand Suffolk County recently did something. Uh, Suffolk yeah, did. Yeah. Nassau is moving. New York City has pending legislation that will likely get uh, a vote before the end of the year. So um, if it's so small, if these beads, these plastic beads are so small, what difference does it make? I mean, I mean, I can understand if it was a large number, a, a large piece of plastic, yeah. but it doesn't it degrade quicker, it being so small? It doesn't, because it's plastic. Plastic takes a long time to degrade. You're not supposed to dump any plastic overboard in your ship. You can do all sorts of things, you know, after you get 18 miles away from a coastline. But the one no-no in maritime <laughs> is plastic. You can never dump that overboard. Um, no matter so how minor, and micro, and nano it might be. Precisely. You know, so if you look at the maritime sort of regulations, everybody knows that that's just a no-no to be dumping that stuff. But here we have this standard that allows them to just dump this freely through our sewer systems. And those little plastic beads add up to a big problem over time. They mm -hmm. get ingested and move up sort of the food chain. So, you know, think of the fish and the birds you may be eating that have ingested this stuff. You're basically now ingesting plastics, let alone you may be brushing your teeth with these little plastic bits and ingesting those right away. We've had dental hygienists come to the hearings and come to us and say, I'm actually cleaning these now out of our patient's teeth. Wow. Um, so it's, you know, small, but an enormous problem and a growing threat to our water bodies that what's gratifying is to see local leaders sort of stepping in with the Senate failed. Okay, well, that's a good education. That's good. I was really uh, not quite sure what to make of why these are such a problem. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, first off, you shouldn't be scrubbing plastic against your face. Right. And that's the first problem. Right. The second you know, part of it is, is that it just flow freely down into our water bodies, and we shouldn't be dumping plastic in water, All however right. small. Now, what's this federal carbon protections? Sure. That, you know, can you talk about that a little bit? Because yeah. you were applauding about this year. <laughs> well, <laughs> for a number of years, President Obama has, has attempted to sort of put standards in place that would lower carbon pollution from power plants. Oh. And this summer, he finally enacted rules to do just that. In New York State, we've had these standards in place since uh, the fall of 2008 that would ratchet down carbon pollution from power plants. Carbon pollution is related to global warming. What type of power plants are we talking about? Nuclear power plants? No. No, we're talking about stuff that burn fossil fuels. That's what you get. We, car, carbon pollution is a function of combustion. So a fire in a fireplace, you get carbon pollution. Gasoline in a car, coal in a coal-fired power plant, natural gas. Right. Coal, I can imagine, is carbon, but yep. I just wasn't sure what the other... Yeah, it's typically yeah. through combustion. That's where you get carbon dioxide. You also can get carbon from methane gas wafting off emissions from gas lines. So Are the fuels getting better, though? I think I read that the, the coal, that's what Mark was mentioning, there's white coal. Again, I don't know. I mean, you're the expert, and I just said that they say they are trying to make a better product that doesn't make such a pollution. Yeah. I think we all learned a hard lesson this fall when, when, when the whole revelations came out with Volkswagen that they were producing clean <laughs> diesel, when really they weren't producing clean diesel, they were cheating. 
So I've been always skeptical of somebody saying we can make coal clean. It's a dirty fuel. It's uneconomical now because of the low price of natural gas. Um, and in this state, we're sort of moving beyond coal. Um, you know, so there's a number of different technologies out there. So we really like these federal rules. Um, you know, New York State is going to be able to comply with them 10 years in advance of when they're required to. That really shows the leadership we took in 2008 and 9. Um, when I was in the governor's office doing uh -huh. these standards, um, you know, paid off um, by doing that sort of pioneering leadership. That's great. Um, yeah. But I, I must say that... No wonder you're applauding it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I, I would like, I would have liked Obama to push New York State to do more. I think uh -huh. they let them off the hook. Their initial draft had New York and New York to do much more. The governor's office did a very effective lobby campaign and uh, the Obama administration blinked. It's unfortunate. I, w I wish they held New York to a higher standard to keep us reaching. Um, you know, but the governor has set out some really lofty goals. Um, he's supportive of the Clean Power Plan, but he wants to achieve half of our electricity from renewable energy or clean sources like solar and wind. Uh, by 2030, he wants to achieve deep reductions in pollution uh, in between now and 2050. So, um, so let me, add, while we're talking about energy, uh, what are, there's one of the nuclear reactors up north that they want to shut down. Is it the Fitzpatrick plant? It is, precisely, yes. Yeah. And that's near Syracuse? Yeah. Oswego, Syracuse. Oswego. So well, are you in favor of that being shut down? Are you anti-nuclear? Is there a place for nuclear in the mix of all the renewable energies or anything? Or? You know, I think really the emphasis should be on sort of shifting away from energy sources that could cause harm. Um, you know, n nuclear energy in the short term has no carbon emissions at the facility itself. They do elsewhere. Um, you know, so as those phase out, it gives us the opportunity to really ramp, ramp up more spending on solar and wind. So you're happy that Fitzpatrick's going to be shut down? Well, I'm not happy about the fact that we don't have a really good transition plan. The company just decided it's uneconomic, we're going to shut it down. What we really should do is think of a logical transition of moving that plant offline mm -hmm but making the community whole. And but you're not really crying doing. about the fact that it's going to be shut. You're not pro-nuclear. No, I no. mean, it's a really dangerous way and dirty way to boil water, essentially. I mean, you have a very toxic byproduct left over that's going to be around for hundreds of years. It probably doesn't make sense for that to be our approach to boil water to create steam for electricity. We should be really relying much more on solar and wind and doing a Hydro, heck of a lot more. Hydropower. Yep. Yeah. Um, we should be doing a heck of a lot more to help um, businesses and homeowners cut their energy waste. So now we hear that, you know, I don't know if you saw this uh, a few weeks ago, but it was a, a study that solar isn't, solar panels are not so good because it's preventing the sun's rays from getting into the ground and, and you know, and uh, feeding the nutrients that are in the soil. I think, there may be, I, mean, I think there may be a couple of places that that might happen. But Did you hear of, about that? Well, you hear a lot of different stories. I've heard a lot of different tales about wind power causing all sorts of health ailments. Um, well, wind you know, is an aesthetic thing also because some people say it's a, it, these are art forms, these wind turbines, and others say, oh, it's a travesty on our landscape. Yeah. So, you know, that's a personal I, I look opinion, at all this but, stuff and say that we have a heck of a lot of built environment that could support solar. Wind, to me, and when I look at a wind farm, I think fewer kids are going to get asthma attacks, fewer seniors are going to have respiratory disease because of bad air quality, because it's not coming out of a smokestack. Wind is turning electricity without the pollution. So for me, I look at them as beautiful because it means fewer people getting sick, fewer seniors dying prematurely. And the uh, and solar, you don't see as an issue in terms of, you know, the nutrients in the ground being an issue. I, I think we'd have to see an enormous amount of solar across all of our landscapes for that to be a real issue. But okay. some of this stuff gets out there, and people pick up on it. Well, and they're sounding it they're sounding the alarm on solar. These you know these folks, whoever I forgot who's saying it, but you know they're sounding the alarm on solar the way you're sounding the alarm on coal and carbon and, yeah. you know, so I'm just... I get that. I everyone's get that. sounding an alarm. <laughs> yeah, and I think, I think realistically people should be thinking about buildings and building solar into the building skins, um, you know, on rooftops. I mean, you know, there's ample space there sure. before we have to worry about solar taking over our nutrient load. All right, so now we're going to be having a new environmental conservation commissioner, uh, Basil Sigos. Yep. 
Did I pronounce that right? I think so. Okay. I mean, it's actually Segos, but close Segos. enough. Uh, <laughs> name like I want to, so I should know how to pronounce other people's names. Try and pronounce it. <laughs> there you go. So what? What? Are you, what are his? Uh, you know, I. You support him. Uh, you, you know, you're a fan of his. What? What's about him that you should? That you're such a fan of his for? Well, we uh, we like you know the fact that the governor has chosen somebody that we know and have worked with. Um, you know, I, I actually transitioned myself from working in the governor's office to be the head of the agency in 2010, so I know what it entails, and I know the personal sacrifice that goes into it. So this guy is transitioning from the governor's office to the agency? That's right. Oh, okay. So, I mean, I think it's somebody that we know, we've worked with, we understand, but obviously he's there to sort of carry out the governor's vision. You know, there's good parts of the governor's vision, and there's bad parts Are of the Are the two of your buds? Um, who's this? The, you, the governor you, and I? You and Basil. Well, we've had our disagreements over time, but I think we understand this is a professional environment where you can work through those types of things. You we don't go hiking together, huh? No, <laughs> we don't. <laughs> well, I figured, you know, you yeah. could be enjoying the environment together. It might be a good thing. <laughs> I try to uh, spend my personal time with my family. I, I gave up a lot working in government and flying back and forth to D.C., so... My personal time is my family time now. I try not to work during it. I hear you. Okay, <laughs> well, yeah, come to the four corners for the Hanukkah menorah light. There you go. <laughs> okay, is it so. The sixth or the seventh? I forget. Sixth. Six. Six. Sunday, Sunday sixth. night. All right. So, anything else you want to bring up that we didn't know enough to ask you about? Well, I mean, I think we've covered a lot of stuff, but yeah. I, the biggest priority, I think, facing a lot of environmentalists in the next year is really is New York State going to put its climate and clean energy goals into law so that everybody knows what the standards are? Businesses can sort of write a business model to make money on it. Environmentalists and the rest of the public health world can understand how dramatically we're going to reduce pollution, how fast we're going to do it, um, and how clean things are going to get. And, and, the, and another governor might not, who d might not see it the way this governor does, might shift course. And if it's precisely. in law, it, you know. Yeah, I mean, what we saw in California is a great example of that. In 2006, they put their climate commitments into law under Governor Schwarzenegger. We've now got a couple of governors since. Jerry Brown is sort of implementing that, and the legislature is coming together to write new standards into law that, that increase the sort of pollution reduction benefit and the opportunities for clean energy. So when you put things in law, you create regulatory certainty and a business opportunity that sort of flows from that. Are you drafting your uh, agenda for the next session now? We are, we are. Yeah, we'll okay. finalize it in the next couple of weeks and sort okay. of lay it out when they come back in January. Well, we'll have you back and we'll talk about those issues uh, at a future time. Look forward to it, thanks. All right, so thank you very much. You're doing good work for the people in New York State, cleaning air, clean water. You can't argue with that. So uh, keep on going with good success. And like Mark says, we'll check in with you to see where, where things are going. Great, thanks. Okay. Keep up the good work. I appreciate it.